Um, okay, so my second uh, topic I wanted to talk about was was, was how you select um, the journal, which when you're considering you've got a, you've done a piece of research um, and you're considering which journal you select uh, you want to select for, for the publication, how do you make that decision? What factors influence your, your choice? So there's different factors really, several facts. Some of them are contradictory and a few of them are very specific to our research context in the UK um, and, and a few of them are more sort of disciplinary choice. So for overall political science there's very different strands of political science and there's a, a, a strand of political science which is highly quantitative highly focus on very specific variables and all of that and there's quite a few journals like American Political Science Review that sort of journals which publish in that area and that's the type of journal I wouldn't even consider for lots of reasons one is that they would never even consider one of my publications uh, secondly it, they use methods that are just not what I use um, and thirdly, they are so, so competitive that I know that I would have no chance whatsoever. But also, actually more importantly, and that's one of the, at the end of it, is one of the main, the fact that matters the most to me, is that the audience, the people who read that journal, are not the ones I want to talk to. They're not the audience for who I'm, I'm writing. So, I would, I would consider, first of all, is the audience who reads the journals, and in there, there's almost like a conflict thing because there are journals specialised in my area, um, which is parliamentary studies. So one of them is a journal that I co-edit, so parliamentary affairs. There's also the Journal of Legislative Studies, also edited here in the UK. There is an American one called Legislative Studies Quarterly, which is a bit of that strand, very highly quantitative. I wouldn't rule that one out. But again, it's not necessarily the audience I'm very interested. I can't remember last time I cited an article from there they're just not talking about the things I'm interested in. So within my area, I basically have two main journals and obviously I can't publish there all the time because also I want to talk to a wider audience. I don't want, because if you're always publishing in a very small area, then you're always talking to the same people and you want to reach out as much as possible to different people. So I also look at other journals. So for instance, uh, politics and evidence, uh, po policy and politics, which we have published recently, and that, that sort of journals, what it does is that it's read by people who work in general on policy, on political institutions, on engagement in different sorts, not necessarily, not necessarily about parliament, but they touch on the themes I'm touching, and by publishing in those journals, I will reach out to academics, to audiences who don't know about me, who don't know about my work, and and, and that is much more stimulating in terms of disseminating your research. You then get feedback, you get to know other people, you develop your ideas. So that's basically how I choose how I choose the journals. And there's another one, a very good one in the UK, which is Political Studies, which again will publish articles in any area of politics. And I think those journals are really interesting to publish in. The problem is that sometimes it's a bit difficult to publish in there because they get so many, so many submissions. And then there's a UK context, which I don't know if you want me to go through hmm. that, but That'd yeah. Be interesting, yeah. Which is what, it's the REF cycle, so that's Research um, Excellence Framework. So it's this, how our research is, an, is evaluated. So it's evaluated, our research in universities, it's evaluated three, through cycles of five to eight years. And so the whole of my school and my university will be assessed in that cycle. And in that assessment, they'll look at different things. One of the things they'll look at is which articles have you published or which books you have you published and are they of high quality or low quality. And so it involves every single output that you nominate. So you nominate, say, three to five, it will be read by someone in, like in the jury and they'll make an assessment saying this is a four star, which is the highest, or this is a one star, which is the lowest. And in that assessment, one of the things that it's sort of a, and it's, it's sort of an assumption is that the higher impact factor of the journal and the broader the journal, the more likely it would have been difficult to publish there. And because of that, 
those articles published in that type of journals are more highly ranked. Almost regardless of the content, um, obviously it doesn't work that way. So obviously you could publish an article which is really not very good in one of those journals and then someone in the jury comes and reads it and say actually this is not that good. Um, but just the fact you have published in a journal like that straight away the way the jury is going to read your article will be with a different disposition towards it because they'll know that to get published it will have gone through a reviewing process where say three or four people will have read that article blind and made comments on it so you'll know it will have gone through a, a sort of a filtering process already so that's a very specific context to the UK so because of that as academics we're very um, minded to, whilst we can publish within our discipline journals, we're also very minded to also publish in what we call high impact factor journals. Two, two things that sort of spring to mind there though, is, is, and <coughs> just, um, one would be that um, those high impact factor journals are will have more uh, submissions to them, it will take longer to be published in them, um, and secondly, it's a cycle, isn't it? That there will be certain times within this five-year ref cycle where people will be keen yes. to get their work out. Yeah. Um, and it might be uh, that those are two things that possibly are worth considering when submitting work. It's the timing and the, and the, and the journal. Definitely. So some of, the, some of the journals with a very high impact factor, um, you know, four, five, six, that sort of thing, um, they will have so many articles submitted that actually that it's very likely if it gets through for submission it will take some time to be reviewed but actually in some of these journals there's something like a 50 to 70 percent rejection at desk what we call desk rejection so there's, the article is submitted the editor looks at it and decide no this is not going to go anywhere and rejects it so in some ways that's better because it's better that you have that decision and then you can move on to a different journal and usually that decision happens very quickly within the mm. week, two weeks. Um, but if that doesn't happen then you go through the reviewing process and the reviewing process it will vary a lot from journal to journal and my advice would be for people to check on their on the websites and even to, to email editors or editorial assistants that's absolutely fine as editors and editorial assistants we used to answer those queries all the time so asking roughly how long will it take for for the reviewing process that's not always um, editors don't always control on that because the reviewing process is always dependent on reviewers and there's actually a lot of difficulty in first of all identifying reviewers convincing reviewers to do the review because it's a non-paid job, it's a job that people do because they want to be good citizens, good academics and one of my roles as an editor actually, the thing that takes me the longest is to find suitable reviewers. Yeah. So, and then when you, when you do get the reviewers, then, um, you know, they're doing a favour to you really. So they might, we might give them a month to submit the review but they might take three months for perfectly good reasons. So a reviewing process, from my experience these days, takes about um, about three months more or less, but it could take, last much longer. And I mean, my own last article that was submitted took took forever, and and it, and it was because the editors couldn't find suitable reviewers. They actually told me then what was the issue. In the end, they got four in the end because people then went back to them. Um, so there was something else about that that I was going to say and, I, and it's gone now. Okay, uh, well it's really interesting to hear a little bit more about the nitty gritty mm. of, of, of you know, the job of an editor. How many, at uh, Parliamentary Affairs, how many roughly um, submissions do you get each month that you will have to look at? Yeah, it's, it's really difficult, I remember what I was going to talk about, about how, sort of how many submissions um, and, and the timings. Yeah. It's really difficult to judge because there's timings of the year where we get loads, there are other times when we don't get anything. So at the end of the summer we usually get quite a few um, and then sort of towards Christmas again we get quite a few so, and then between sort of when the academic year is on basically we tend not to get many and then lots are submitted. So it's difficult to say on our, how many but I'd say on average we probably get um, maybe just about two or three, 
um, sort of on average. But as I said, Parliamentary Affairs is a very specialised journal, so we get far fewer than other journals. So somewhere like uh, Political Studies or the Comparative Politics, you know, the bigger journals, they get far more than, than that. Um, but they also have bigger editorial teams mm. to, to go through that. And as an editor, what do you look for? What's the first thing you look for in, in, a, in a submission? That's really important, because that's actually the sort of things that people sometimes don't think about. But one thing that's really important is a title. It might seem just a silly thing, but the title is so useful. And the amount of times I get the submission and the title just means nothing. And I, and I look at it thinking, but what is this about? And if I'm thinking that, then that means the reviewers are going to think that, which means the reviewers might say, no, I'm not reviewing because I don't know what it is. Um, it also might be that they get the wrong idea about what it is and they might not understand why we're inviting them, although we, we do, we try to make them as in, the request as individual to each review as possible, although all of that takes time, obviously. And then the other key thing I'd say is the abstract. So the abstract, again, quite often people do it like 10 minutes job before submitting a journal. Please never do that. The abstract is so, so important. It really is important. Definitely do it at the end you've done your, your article because it's only once you've got your article ready that you know what it is about rather than writing at the beginning. Don't do a summary or copy and paste of your introduction. I see that a lot and that just, it communicates sloppiness, it communicates laziness, it communicates the fact that you don't realise how important the abstract is because the abstract is the window into your journal article and it will be online, once it's published it will be online and anyone will move on to read your article if the abstract is clear, communicates what it is about and what the findings are and any assessment, whatever their career is, whatever it is, the first thing people will do like an overall assessment of an article will be through the abstract. So do spend some time on the abstract. So the abstract should situate what the article is about, what's the question it's trying to answer, what is it trying to address. Sometimes the abstracts are just background information, sometimes, because sometimes that's just a copy and paste of introduction. It's more about setting out what is it about, what's the key question, what are the key methods used or the approach used, and then finishing the key findings, what were the key findings. So, and a, and a good abstract goes a long, long way in, in portraying, in disseminating an article. Because if it's a good abstract, then people will be inclined to read your article. So as an editor, likewise, the abstract is really important. So that's the first thing I look at. Um, and, and, and that, depending on the topic, might give me straight away ideas about who to ask for, for reviewers. And then if that doesn't get what we tend to do, and that's a really good tip, is to look at the bibliography and see who are these people, who are the people being cited, who are the people likely to know about it. Because as someone submitting an article, you have to remember that we as editors, we're not expert on everything. I know loads about Parliament, I've been doing it for 30 years, but I don't know about a lot of specifics, I don't know the literature, the authors. So if some topics are known straight away which reviews to ask, for others, I wouldn't. So I would use, look at the bibliography, and that would give me a sense of what are the key, who are the key people writing in that area. But also, then there's a process of are they likely to, to do a review for, for you or not. So you also have to balance that out. One thing is, I think it's useful to to know is that if it's a, a journal article about a specific country or specific parliament, we would always include someone who knows about that area. So we may have, so we usually go for three reviewers. In some cases we might just go for two, in other cases we might go for four, depending on you know, how many different views we need, and that depends a lot on the article. Um, and so if we're going for three reviewers, it may be that it's two on the theme. So say it's something about uh, parliamentary bills and whether men and women submit different types of bills, which is a type of article we get a lot. Um, I may have an expert on legislation, I might have an expert on gender and parliament and then say it's something in Taiwan or in Angola or the US, I'll have an expert from that case study. And, and so the, the expert from that, 
from that case study, from that country, we'll be able to, to check are there any things in here that we wouldn't spot that are completely wrong, are they missing on some you know, crucial party or crucial procedure, something like that. And then and the other sort of the more subject expertise are, are going to, to read in terms of is this telling us anything to our discipline? Is this adding to what we know about gender and parliament? Is this adding to what we know about legislative politics? Um, so that's how we go about choosing reviewers. And, but you know, it's really difficult to get reviewers these days. And so a lot of time is spent on drafting, making sure you... But also, the other thing is that you don't want to waste reviewers' time. So you don't want to send something that you can see is going to be rejected. And, and that's why the, the journals that get lots of, reject, lots of submissions, they reject a lot because they only have a, a certain pool of reviewers and they don't want to be sending out things they know will be rejected or very likely to be rejected. Um, so the, the way we use the time of our reviewers, it's a crucial, crucial part of what we do as, as editors. So the, 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 the first stage is that it goes to the editor, they may um, feel it doesn't fit with the theme of the, of the journal, but if they do, it will go out to peer reviewers. It can take some time for those reviews to come back. Mm -hmm. What what would be your advice on dealing with the, the responses from the reviewers? How you know because they can be quite critical, yes. you know, and it, it, especially when you've worked so hard on an article. How you know what would you be, your your advice on, on on the feedback that people get mm -hmm. and how to how to sort of deal with it? And yes, that's that that's a really difficult part of the process, receiving the the reviews and reading it. And, and to be honest about it, they tend to be quite brutal, quite um, negative. Even if they haven't been written in that sense. I do lots of reviews to other journals, almost as, as a part of my own duty. And I always try to be as constructive as possible. I always try to, uh, to point out what's really good about it and to be as specific as possible, Things being helpful about things could improve. But I think sometimes, even if you write yourself, you think you're being constructive, and you find out we're doing feedback to students, it's the same process, that they will read in a different way. They will read, oh, it's all terrible, even if it's not, even if it's just identifying things to improve. So I think it's a bruising process regardless, and I think what my advice would be that when you get those comments, don't take them as personal, don't take them as saying that the journal, the article's got no chance whatsoever because if you if the editor has given you an opportunity to revise and to resubmit it's because they think it's good that's a downlining principle if they thought it wasn't good they wouldn't give you that chance they would reject it so the comments that when you actually read the comments obviously they tend to be anonymous which makes people think you know I always think that anything anonymous it's more brutal for one reason or another so if I give feedback face to face to a student I can see their reaction, I can explain things, I can see that a word I've said might be misinterpreted, I can do lots of things. If I'm writing, typing feedback and a student takes away and reads it elsewhere, um, and I don't know who that student is, I, I write the feedback to, as anonymously, then it's completely different, they will interpret a different way. And I think with reviews is the same thing. So my advice is when you get it, just remember, it's a good article, otherwise you would not get a chance to review it and then to take the comments that you received as an opportunity, as an opportunity to make your article being uh, relevant, being read by a wider audience. Because what the reviewers are doing is just asking questions about it. And if they're asking questions, it might be that sometimes we are, we, the people who write our articles, we know so much about it already. There's so many things that are just clear that we don't actually see the other things. And what the reviewers are doing is just showing, look, there's these other things, you know, this this wasn't very clear, and have you considered something else? And um, so I will take it as an opportunity to actually improve your article, and, and I will try to get over the fact that it's negative. Just, you know, just take it for granted. It will feel negative. I mean, I, I'll go, I get reviews all the time, obviously, as an editor, and they, this, it's just in the nature of what it is. Now, obviously, that there are cases where reviewers can be particularly brutal, but that's a question, you know, we're all humans and some people are not very nice. <laughs> uh, but my advice would be if the editor gives you the opportunity to, to review, um, just forget about the negativity and trying to make the most in terms of addressing 
those comments. Then there's an issue about how you respond to that. Do you want me to go through that now? Yeah, it'd be interesting because I mean, you, you don't have to make all the changes that are suggested. And sometimes when you have two or more reviewers, they can actually be contradictory yes. in what they, they say. So how to yeah. deal with that? Yeah. Well, first of all, you'd hopefully have an editor that says that some of the rev comments of the reviewers might be contradictory. And so hopefully you'd get some guidance from editors saying, uh, realise that this is contradictory, can you please follow more reviewer too? Something like that. I would always follow the advice, the lead of the editor. So I had a situation like that recently as a, as a writer, as a journal, as an article writer, where I had four reviews and two of them were completely contradictory. One of them was completely off, just didn't really get anything about the article. And, and between the four, there's just so many comments in there, it would have been really difficult to, dif to address all of them and still keep a coherent article that was still my research. And the editor was just excellent in that. He just said, from these, these are, dif these are the, all the points I wanted to address. Now, that's, that doesn't always happen, and, and most of the time people only have two reviews anyway, or three. Um, but I would always say that when you do your review, when you, when you do the changes, take note of what the editor tells you and then when you do your changes or in when you send the article back do send a document outlining in detail as clear as possible what changes you made in what way that addresses the comments of, of, of the reviewers and in some cases if you think the comments that the reviewers made that you just can't act on them because it would be a different research because sometimes reviewers are saying well this is the right question, you should have gone and read that, then you just have to be very honest about it and say, look, I thought this would be a completely different article, so I didn't address that. But always also be um, sort of very polite in a way you do that and appreciative of the comments. Even when, if you review, receive, when you receive the review, you might feel you know, quite mad at the reviewers. When it gets to the point of responding, remember to thank the comments received and appreciate how it made you think about the article in a different way and then outline in the document exactly how you did all the changes. I would even go as far as saying that it depends on the scale of the changes but if you can highlight in your revised article either by highlighting or different colour writing or whatever the bits that you changed even that would be really helpful. So anything to then help the editor and quite often then that goes back to reviewers. So any anything that helps in terms of clarity to clarify which points you address and in what way and which ones you didn't but why, all of that then ensures that it will be accepted. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. Good sort of hacks for how to Yeah. Yeah, how to in, in general though, sort of what strategies do you think um, young researchers could adopt to get on this publishing mm. ladder? Because I think the hurdle is that first, you know, yes. piece of, of work that is is submitted. What, what, how can that be made easier or you know, what would you recommend as a, as a strategy for getting on the publishing ladder? Yeah, there's, there's a number of different things you can do. One of them is actually to try to be a reviewer yourself. So sometimes we, we often struggle with reviewers from outside the UK or from outside you know, countries we know really well, the US, France and that sort of countries. And, and for instance, if I had an article on Ethiopia, uh, I mean now I might know some contacts because thanks to the P4B, but if it was um, about a country like, I don't know, Kenya, let's say, um, South Korea, I mean actually there, there are some names in there that probably would come to me, but there are lots of case studies that we don't necessarily have a lot of, uh, uh, our pool of review is not very big. And so there's no harm whatsoever in people contacting the journals and saying, look, I'm a political scientist, I work in, in Ethiopia, I've done all of, these are my publications, this is my record, or this is my research. Um, and so particularly young researchers, even if they don't have a lot of uh, publications done yet, they can say, this is the research I'm, I'm in, I'd be really interested to, to know how the reviewing process so if you ever have something that falls within these areas, it doesn't have to be about my country, it can be about these areas, I would really appreciate the, the, the opportunity to act as a reviewer. Because people can, they can always be a top-up, for instance, and, and it's always useful to have another voice, 
So that's something that the young researchers sometimes, sometimes when reviewers we go sort of to professors and, and senior level, but actually I try to bring in young researchers that I know of as much as possible because they have quite often have more time, are actually more careful at reading uh, the article, um, and they can give a you know a different point of view. So that's one thing people could do. Another thing that again I try to do with my own PhD students is core writing an article. So they may take the lead, so I'm doing that with a, a student now, um, they may take the lead in the, in the article and they may even have you know the, the name first and all of that, but the fact that I am co-authoring with them, it gives them the confidence in moving forward, it, it gives them the, all the advice about the structure of the article, something I haven't spoken about, but the structure of the article is really important. Um, and, that, and any advice I'm giving you now, I can give all that advice mm. to my PhD student or to any young researcher um, as we call right. So I've done that quite, with quite a few people um, and I think that's something that works really well. So co-writing with someone else, preferably someone with a bit more experience so that you can benefit from that, it's a, it's a good way of getting on the publication ladder. You mentioned structure. How, I mean, yeah. What is a good structure for an article? Do you, do you have a sort of template or...? Um, there's, there's a bit of a, a, a tension there. There's, there is, it's spreading more and more a specific structure, which I don't particularly like, but you see a lot, and so it's a structure that works, where you have your introduction, a very long introduction, where you set out all, you know, all the key uh, research questions and all that, and then you have a section which is almost like the theory where the hypotheses come out, and then you have a section which is the findings, and then you have a section which is discussion. And that's, that's becoming more and more standard type of structure. I mean, I, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't go against that, because I know it's one tradition of doing uh, articles, but in my view, that's quite a lazy way of doing things, and, and I think it's better if it has a structure that actually has more meaning, so it's not just findings, discussion, you know, it's what does it mean, so that the heading's actually indicating what that area is. So there's another side to do that structures which is much more about still I would still say always have an introduction that introduces the rest of the article introduces the key question and what the rest of the article is going to do and that's really important and then that's usually followed by a theoretical section that sets out the key theories what they've talked about, about that why does it matter to look at it and and then the methodology and then after that that's where I differ from that other position I was telling you before I would then present the, the, the findings and discuss them as I go along by the relevance. So I may have, you know, maybe two other headings which are the key areas that I want to explore in the article. And then the conclusion, do a summary of it all and perhaps point out to possible future research. But sometimes the structures, um, the theory gets mixed up with, with the findings. Uh, the methodology is not there, uh, even if it's qualitative methodology, however people think, well, I, I just did some interviews, but there's still things to say about the interviews. It's still useful to have a methodology. And the headings are really important, signposting. So signposting for the reviewer, for the editor, what is this about? Because you know who it, what it is about, but anyone reading it should also understand what it is. So as you're writing it and you're just thinking of your structure, you, you think of it in terms of guiding the reader. So in all of this, I mean, when we've, you've talked about title, abstract, structure, mm -hmm. headings, always be thinking about the reader and, yes. and, and considering how they think, because obviously you will know this material perfectly as, a, as yeah. the author, but how do you think about the reader? Um, that's really, really helpful, and it's, it's, I've certainly learned a lot. Um, can you just give one maybe final piece of advice or encouragement for, for the, uh, the, the scholars that will be at the P4P workshop <laughs> in McKayley? I, I'd say definitely uh, persevere. At, at trying to publish and I mean I'm very happy for anyone to contact me I think Amati is one of the mentors anyway for any further advice and I think it, it is difficult I had a similar discussion in Brazil just now in the summer because I was talking to um, scholars in Brazil and they were saying how difficult they find to to publish uh, in international uh, journals and and I think, and they do excellent work, really, really good work. And, and I think it's all about how you communicate it. And that is really the key barriers to think that, you know, how, how is your study of relevance for an international audience? And, and perseverance is really, really important. 
I would also probably start with what we call the, the lower impact factor journals, just because it's more realistic that that articles would be considered from someone that doesn't have a lot of experience. And, and then once you go once you're through the process once, actually after that is everything is much easier. Uh, I mean the reviews are always brutal, but the process or how you deal with it becomes much easier. So I would say perseverance. Um, use the people from P4P and always think about maybe reaching out um, to maybe journals with a low impact factor at the beginning rather than going for the very higher ranking ones. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much, Christine. And, and not just for me, but also from everyone that's <coughs> going to be at the workshop because I'm sure they'll really welcome. appreciate everything you've said. Thank you. You're welcome. That was. Uh...